I call the Monday, November 27th work session meeting of City Council to order. And Madam Clerk, will you call our roll, please? Yes, sir. Mr. Cherry? Here. Mr. Clark? Here. Mrs. Lucasburg? Here. Mr. Moody? Here. Ms. Simmons? Here. Dr. Whitaker? Here. Mayor Rowe? Here. And we're meeting uh, jointly tonight with our uh, Housing Authority, uh, the Board of Portsmouth Redevelopment and Housing Authority, and welcome. Thank you. And uh, Chairman Davey Smith, would you want to call your meeting to order? Yes, uh, I call the PRHA meeting to order. Uh, now I'll do roll call. Commissioner Roberts? Here. Commissioner Londe? Here. Commissioner Chapman? Here. Commissioner Harris? Commissioner Cofield? Vice Chair Washington? Present. And myself, President. Okay, thank you. Thank you, sir. Well, thank you again to, for taking time out of a what's still a holiday season, I think. Yes, sir. <laughs> Dover ham and turkey yeah, at our house <laughs> and dressing uh, to meet with us tonight. And uh, why don't we start the meeting uh, by Chairman Smith, if you would give us an update on, on what you're doing. Yes, sir. Um, I believe Mr. Bland has already sent over our PHA highlights to you all. Uh, first, I'll start off with finance. Uh, 2016 uh, independent audits of the Housing Authority and its partnership contained no findings or question cost. Um, also, 2016 public housing assessment financial score was 23 out of a possible 25 points. Then um, they have development. They had the sale of the property at 433 Chestnut Street to Wendy's, closed October 5th, 2017. Generated $248,175.57 in Community Development Block Grant, GD, GDP, G, GDBG program income. Then also we had a transfer of a property at 1541 High Street to the City of Portsmouth in support of Portsmouth Community Health Foundation, closed on August 30th, 2017. And uh, Dale's Home, rental assistance uh, Demonstration, our RAD program and renovation, phase one. Renovation of 95 of 146 units completed 64% with completion of, with completion, with completion project by March. Please correct that that should be 2019, March 2019. And um, phase two renovation of the remaining 150 units is scheduled to commence in the winter of 2018. Our LIHTC LI program application for the redevelopment of Lincoln Park will be submitted in March of 2018. Next item we have is housing. We welcome 35 new landlords to the program, increase the number of our of assisted HCV families from 1,624 to 1,676. Receive notification of our Section 8 Management assessment, assessment Program performance rating from HUD as a high performer, 97 out of 100, which I think <coughs> is great. Work completed in Swanson Home for Hurricane Matthew, three plus million dollars spent. Also, we have 11 families graduating, uh, graduated high school seniors and, and adults were awarded scholarships for the 2000. 17-18 school year, ranging from $500 to $1,500 for the total of $9,000. Since 2011, we have awarded nearly 90 scholarships and have awarded almost $120,000. Additional information, um, we're disposing of PRHA-owned properties purchased by CDBG funds. And also, we plan to uh, have a retreat with you all, the city, in the spring of 2018. And um, the TIF district, the tax increment financing in the Prince Park area of the city, nearby Lincoln Park. Right. Mayor Rowe? Um, those last three items is, appears to be items for discussion. Yes, sir. Okay. <coughs> um, members of city council, do you have questions on the top two thirds of that report? I have two. Um, up under finance, this public housing assessment financial score? Who, who does that? I'm going I'm to let uh, Scott, Scott, our finance director here, he can tell you, reference that. Yeah. Um, could you come forward? Yeah. Please, so we can see you. Mm -hmm. <coughs> 
Bring the two chairs so the camera can see you right there. <laughs> Good evening. Good evening. The, uh, the, the financial assessment score for, for our financials is done by HUD. It is done off of a financial report that we submit to them electronically annually. That report is submitted in an unaudited uh, fashion by the end of August. Then it is audited and it is updated as an audited submission before March of every year following. So we don't obviously have the 2017 number, but for 2016, the score is 23 out of 25. So it's HUD that makes it that. It is HUD, yes. HUD makes that determination based on our audits. Okay. And a question. Go ahead. Oh, no. Second question, this may be you too, I don't know. What is an LIHTC application for Lincoln Park? Low income housing tax credit. Thank you. Going back to, to Councilwoman Simmons' first question. Yes, sir. Uh, the assessment is um, of what? It says financial assessment? Yes, they do They do an assessment of our finance management <coughs> physical condition. Um, the, the management physical condition are done at later times and by different areas of HUD, but they're all done by HUD. So we come up with a total score, hopefully very close to 100 points. We've been a high performing agency for three straight years, meaning we've scored over 90. Um, drop that back to a standard performer of 85 out of 100 because of the Dale Homes renovations. Obviously creates a lot of vacant units. And there's nothing we can do. You have, you're juggling vacant units with the, with the assessment score. So this is both a financial and performance uh, yes, the, the, the 23 or 25 is just for the finance, however, okay. for, that, for that period of time. Uh, reference uh, Swanson <coughs> Homes, uh, see where we spent $3 million on the uh, hurricane damage. Uh, what's the status of the insurance claims? May I ask Alicia and Brian to come up and talk about that? We are working with Allstate to um, complete our claim. We have not received the funds yet. Um, <coughs> we're still waiting on them and FEMA assistance. So we have spent money, but we haven't got that money back yet. Is anything in dispute? Uh, reference no. that? No. That's normal to... Uh, delays to of paying. Delay. Yeah, delays of paying. And, and we think we think somebody from FEMA's do because you had a lot of hurricanes that came along <coughs> from Texas to Florida, Puerto Rico. So it's going to be a slow process. But all, but at least you're saying we have submitted everything we need submitted to everything. submit. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks. Mm -hmm. uh, sure. Vice Mayor Cherry. Now, this is reference to the low income tax credits for Lincoln Park. If if that application is successful, what will we expect to, to see from and that redevelopment and when when. Okay. I'm gonna ask Brian, I might come up and talk in reference to that. <coughs> Good evening. Uh, we are planning for a uh, redevelopment of the Lincoln Park uh, public housing community. Uh, so that will in entail a full demolition and a replacement of all of the housing units uh, on site. Uh, we are currently uh, planning for a uh, townhome style, uh, very similar to uh, what you'd find at Seaboard Square. Uh, so that's the plan. How many units should have? Uh, right now we're looking at uh, up to 160. Uh, we were before uh, the City Council previously uh, with approval for up to 178, which is 100% of the units. Uh, we're looking at now maybe reducing that down by about 10%, possibly 20% reduction in density. And you expect to hear back from that? Uh, well, we intend to be before the Planning Commission uh, in December. No, no, I'm talking about the application itself. Uh, the application is due to the Virginia Housing Development Authority in March of uh, 2018, and it t it's typically about a three-month three uh, time frame. To so about summer, July, June, July? Time uh, frame. June time frame. It's a competitive process, uh, so depending upon you know the pool that we compete in, uh, it's possible that it would be highly competitive based on some of the other uh, housing authorities that we uh, would be up against. Uh, but we would expect by June to know uh, where we stand. What's the order of magnitude of that application? Uh, right now we're looking at uh, the first phase, which would consist of 72 units. Uh, so in terms of a total development cost, uh, we're probably somewhere in the neighborhood of about $15 million. For, for 72 units? For 72 for the first phase. And for the balance? Uh, the balance would be anywhere from a uh, comparable amount up to about $20 million. Okay. So total 
thirty to forty million in that uh, range. Forty five million. And we're still still fleshing out, working out the details. There are obviously uh, site costs that are being uh, factored in, uh, but I think somewhere in that neighborhood is appropriate. Yes. Dr. Yes, um, Mr. Donahue, I remember in, I think, um, late 2015 or early 2016, um, PRJ submitted this project for consideration and was um, denied. Um, is there something different that you all are proposing uh, in, in this application which kind of gives you more confidence that in its competitiveness it may be considered? Uh, that's a good question. Uh, we were uh, previously uh, awarded tax credits from the HDA in support of the redevelopment of Lincoln Park, but we ran into some uh, difficulties with HUD review uh, that we uh, have managed to uh, work through. Uh, so we are actually looking at a new program. We were working under a, a pilot program uh, that HUD had in place called uh, the Rental Assistance Demonstration Program, uh, which would allow us to remove the units from uh, the public housing uh, Pool. Uh, we're looking at doing that a different way now. We are going to be uh, working through a uh, Section 18 uh, demolition and disposition application process with HUD. Uh, we believe we have an approval pending that we should have within the next 30 days. Um, and then with that, we'll be project basing uh, housing choice vouchers from our own allocation at the community. Uh, rather than using the pilot program, we have another means now of doing that through uh, some recent changes at HUD. Uh, so I, to answer your question, uh, Madam Man Manager, we, we do have a, a way of doing it and we're moving forward, yes. <coughs> the question with the, um, the low income housing tax credits, are they all the um, redevelopment housing authorities in this area applying for the same um, fund? Uh, it's a competitive process. Uh, the uh, housing authority would compete in a special pool that is a set aside pool. Uh, which is a statewide pool for all housing authorities in the state. So um, as you can imagine, there are a lot of demands uh, for housing authorities that are looking to redevelop and revitalize their housing. Uh, so you know, if, if you've got a, an NRHA in Norfolk who's uh, currently talking about uh, demolishing you know, 1,600 units of housing and, and Richmond is looking to do the same, mm -hmm. uh, it's highly competitive. Uh, HUD has, um, to a lot of uh, degrees, uh, reduce their grant funding opportunities. So the low-income housing tax credit is really one of the, uh, if not the only, uh, main source of funding uh, these types of projects. Uh, it's very close to it. It's ultra-competitive. As you do the Dale Homes Rental Assistance Demonstration and Renovation, uh, are you including a renovation of infrastructure? Um, also within the neighborhood? Yeah, yes, just in their home. Uh, <clears throat> and that's the reason why, I, as one of my talking points, I had to get down to try to talk to the city in reference to the TIF to augment what's going on in that area. Um, because between Lincoln and Dale, it's going, we're, we're spending about $50 million to, uh, between reno rehab and renovation. And we want to see if uh, there's a way to do a, a TIF in that area to kind of, as a whole, to make the area uh, much better. Um, although a TIF would take, to see the benefit from TIF, you, you're talking 15 to 20 years to see the benefits from TIF. And I brought some information tonight at handouts, uh, so maybe we can just look at it and, and talk about it and see if that is something that can be done to try to not only just look at what the housing thought is doing with their property over there, but their surrounding neighborhood, which is uh, very blighted in that area. Uh, before we go to those items, other questions? Then one last question about Lincoln uh, Park: if if the grant <coughs> funds are approved, what is the build-out time that you're looking at? Uh, we're Maybe likely roughly. talking anywhere from three to four years if we're successful in the first round, which would be again uh, this coming spring, so 2018. Use your number of 50 million. You're looking at doing 50 million dollars worth of work. Correct. 
over the next five years if the funds are approved. Correct. Correct. That's not too shabby. <laughs> That's pretty good. Well. Yeah. Thank you for for doing that. Mm -hmm. uh, other questions? Well, let's let's go to your your discussion points. Um. What I did, I bought some handouts. Some, some so I did some printing of. Uh, to try to, since we're talking about redevelopment, to talk about the city trying to uh, do a Tiffin area. And these are just handouts to hand around. Um, I'll take some. You take them back. And Um, what I what I did, I printed down some some uh, inf information on 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 the TIF. Um, that <coughs> if you once you read, it, you see that probably every every jurisdiction in the country have to have TIFs they have created over the years. I sent you an example of uh, one that was created in uh, uh, Chesapeake when Green was completed, as well as one in. Uh, uh, of Virginia Beach, mm -hmm. uh, when they did that one there, uh, and normally what it does it, with a TIF, it take probably 15, a little 15 to 20 years before you see the benefit. But when you read through it, it it kind of tell you what you what you need to do. Um, and normally, what happens if in most jurisdictions they have a uh, fin they have a financial advisor to help them to put together to look and see what a TIF how to put it together that it will work. But I think looking at it that. You have uh, two jurisdictions close to you, which is Chesapeake and Virginia Beach, which uh, did a TIF. Uh, you know that's close to uh, to Portsmouth. Uh, I know um, uh, Richmond had did had this uh, in the area there, but I was trying to think of ways that since the housing authority is going to rehab that area just on our two property, also trying to come up, think about how could money be generated to try to do the surrounding area. And I thought maybe just for reading material, just looking at maybe the a TIF example might be a way to do it uh, for that area or any other area of the city that also may, you know, reach that. I'm not expert at the TIF. Uh, I have um, worked in jurisdiction where they have did the TIF, uh, and I've seen the benefits from the TIF. And like I said, you have two areas uh, close to you, Virginia Beach and uh, and uh, Chesapeake, which I did a TIF uh, uh, that had been very successful at it. And you got Richmond down the road uh, that had their one. And I, I think um, uh, Robert is familiar with the TIF where he, where he worked in, uh, he's familiar with the TIF, uh, uh, I think in Chesapeake, I believe. Yeah. And we, we, we've had some experience with uh, TIFs over at uh, Newport. How, how's that uh, worked out? Uh, let you speak to that, uh, Mr. Uh, Ashby. Um, Mayor, Vice Mayor, members of City Council, we, we are uh, in the midst of discussions right now with regard to the Newport area. Um, and and <laughs> quite honestly, we, we have a portion of it that's before the court and another portion that we are in constant discussion, uh, probably for the second or third year, trying to navigate our way forward 
in a process that's been stuck for quite a few years. And this was uh, on the, the TIF? Uh, C correct. Um, Mr. Bland refers to it as TIF. Um, some refer to it as community um, development authorities. Uh, so under either title, they, they, they encompass the same um, concept. Maybe you know, I, I understand the concept of, of a TIF, and I, I can readily see how it works very well in commercial development, Amen. like in Virginia Beach Town Center or um, Greenbrier commercial development. Uh, you know, my only relationship to a, to a TIF with residential development is with Newport, which you know, hasn't been good. Um, maybe that's because of the, you know, who it was with and the time of year and the bottom fell out of the economy. But, but even so, even if all, everything in the economy is good, I don't quite get how a TIF would be, particularly, I understand it if you're building a new neighborhood, I get that, you know, and you want to put in all your, you know, water and sewer and everything else, but if we were talking about redevelopment of Apprentice Park, I don't understand how TIF even who 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 pays the money and how that even works. Well, <clears throat> that's the reason why uh, the thick item I gave you it kind of gives you the a, the ABCs on how TIF really works. Uh, the, the thick the thick thick book that I gave you. Okay. Uh, and I think once you read through that, it gives you how TIF really works from from start yeah, to finish. I just don't finish. get the residential side of it at all. Yeah, because there are some jurisdictions that just does a residential TIF. Uh, and and, and I'll, I'll be honest with you, I just hand it out uh, because it may work in one jurisdiction, that doesn't mean it may work in another. Mm -hmm. uh, that's the most important thing I want to say is that uh, because it may work in, let's say, Chesapeake or work in um, Virginia Beach or work in Richmond in a residential area. Uh, but I guess my only concern was trying to figure out some way to, because we're doing those two communities the over there, how to do something for the uh, uh, depressed neighborhood which is around. I, I, could, I could see, in fact, in your handout, uh, you, you point out Lynn Haven Mall, which most of us are familiar with. Mm -hmm. And I think that was done to stimulate uh, private investment. Uh, you know, the TIF was used to, to do some improvements, parking garages and mm -hmm. infrastructure improvements, uh, with the hopes of uh, stimulating uh, uh, priv private investment in, into the mall, which I guess has worked. But I, I, I don't see how that, uh, that uh, works in residential uh, as well, if at all. Well, and, and our experience in Newport uh, uh, is that it uh, probably hasn't worked. Mm -hmm. That's why we're talking uh, um, litigation. And sometimes it will. Um, there have been cities where you had private investment come into a TIF for residential. And like I'm saying is um, because it worked in one area doesn't mean it's going to work in another area. It was just it's a matter of uh, trying to figure out how we can, as a team, do something for the area around Lincoln and Dale since we're going to spend quite a bit of money over there just to do those two properties, uh, the, the, the neighborhood around it, trying to do something so that the whole area can, will, will benefit what's going on. Dr. Um, Mayor, Vice Mayor, members of council, as Mr. Bland has said, um, probably about eight weeks ago, when you first came on board, mm -hmm. he shared with me uh, some of his thoughts as it pertains to a TIF. And uh, our team, uh, being finance, economic development, planning, we have um, uh, sat down and kind of came up with the same kind of thoughts that you're having, mm -hmm. a community, neighborhood, not new development replacement. Um, I think it would be beneficial for our team to work together to see what can be done that's absent of um, the city putting itself in a position for some additional financial kinds of hurdles that we are trying to um, segue ourselves through as it pertains to the CDA that we currently have <coughs> and as they proceed in submitting their application uh, just
the team, which is um, your team and our team that meets now. Um, I think it's is it twice a month. We're meeting twice a month. Just kind of continue this discussion to see, absent of, a, of us going out for a TIFF, what kind of brainstorming or what could be done to try to generate something different um, in terms of um, actually um, private, commercial kind of, you're looking at some shops or whatever. So let us kind of continue to just discuss this as, as we wait for their process through an application and other kinds of things that have to be considered. Mr. Moore, part of that team? Mr. Moore is the, te okay. is the team. It's, right. yeah, I, said <laughs> I said economic development. Mr. Moore, Mr. Baldwin, myself, city attorney, finance, all of us, yeah. including his team when, when we're meeting. Yeah, but, but, because, you know, I, those lines get blurred between between the, uh, development and economic development, you know, redevelopment and economic development. Mm -hmm. and, 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 you know, and we've had some issues with that, so I want to make sure that the economic development is economic development and the redevelopment of housing is redevelopment of housing. Right. And so we won't go down the same roads we've been down before. Maybe you want to share, go further. No, I don't. Not right okay. Now. I, I, okay, but he is. He is. He, he's on top of it. He knows what I'm talking about. Okay. I, 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 I grabbed his ear when you first got here. Okay. Very good, Mr. Let's Chair. Let's make sure that we have a consensus that we uh, put this on her work. I worked it. <coughs> Worksheet. Team, and then we'll at some point we'll just come back and give you an update. Yes, but on the sidebar, it's not at the very top of the list. No, for me. no, no. Me neither, and I'm, I'm very leery of it, uh, uh, given our experience over at uh, Newport. So I, 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 I want to see how, how that model is going to work. It, it's about as clear as mud as, as we sit here and discuss it. You know, it's just a broad-based concept. Uh, yes, I was not saying, Mayor, the discussion, I'm, I would, the team would come back and say how we will do a TIF. My comments were working with um, um, Mr. Bland and his team, looking at their project mm -hmm. and what their vision is for how they want to spark some commercial entities where they are going to redevelop the housing that they are going to redevelop. Might that is what. a great topic for our spring retreat. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right, yes. everybody. Sure, man. This time. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah. All right, we've got it. Um, and, and the last, last item um, I have as a talking point was um, for many for many years the the housing authority have worked with the uh, city and we have and the city have uh, gracefully allowed the housing authority using community development money to buy part part land throughout the city and and we have these parcels that the that we can't do anything with the housing authority because some of them some of them are in between two two units they're very small lots and uh, and they're just sitting there but that money was spent for this so it's trying to come up with how we can get those property back on the tax roll uh, and what I have is a handout of where those properties are um, that uh, I think I think the main goal for all of us around here at the table and in the city as a whole, uh, presently with the property that we have that we can't do anything with, uh, the city is not receiving any tax at all from it. And um, the sooner we can figure out how to get those back on the tax road, it can generate property tax for the city. How many parcels on this? Um, mm -hmm. Probably you have close to uh, 100 parcels. There might be close to. And I, I know that we're hoping to have, we're going to plan to have a retreat, uh, retreat with the spring with the city and the housing authority, and maybe this can be something we can look at, you know, when we come together in the spring. But let me give them your thanks. Because the, uh, um, the city manager and I have been talking about it, along with the mayor, trying to put together a retreat for the summer to just talk about these items more so that, uh, once again, our goal as the housing authority, we want to do everything to make sure what we're doing is, is in, is in conjunction with the city want and to also increase the, uh, the, pro the tax property role for the city. We feel that's very important. 
Yes. Yeah, Mr. Glenn, when, when you speak of disposing of um, the PRHA-owned properties that's purchased with the uh, Community Development Block Grant funds, um, well, it's really for Dr. Patton. Yes. Does that place a liability back on the city? Yes, and I wanted to speak to that if I could. Okay. okay. If I may, Mayor. Yes. I, uh, miss, I wanted to kind of give some background. Um, prior to about 1990, 1990, Every dime that the city received for for uh, for um, community development block money that adds up into the millions, all of that money would go to PRHA. And during that era, PRHA purchased hundreds of parcels of properties. However, in purchasing the property, there is a designation of why you're purchasing the property and how you or what are you going to do with the property. But since the 70s up until 93 when CDBG monies began to be used for humanistic purposes, meaning the things that we're doing, the sports complex, the ball fields and things like that, it all went for land. So here we are almost 40 years later that we have amassed all of this land, and some of this land has been sitting since the 70s hmm. or longer. And so now uh, the housing authority holding the land for all of that time is now saying they haven't whatever to get it developed, they bought it, they bought it, they bought it, they bought it, they bought it. It's vacant, it's been vacant. If you go over in Parkview right now, the signs that have been on those parcels that are, are for sale for 32,000, we're not talking lots of money. The signs have faded because no one over the years have bought the property. So for the city now to be asked to take back on all of this property, my answer has been, that is not something that the city at this time can do. You're talking hundreds of pieces of property. Um, they are designated for development or to be developed. Uh, there are guidelines which govern when they are sold. That money has to come back through, as we did with the property for Wendy's, and it comes back through CDBG and then goes back into the city's CDBG fund uh, for use. Uh, in some kind of project, which we have been using it as humanistic projects. So yes, it would be. So, so in this case, um, if it's if it's not used um, to purchase or uh, to develop, then when it's transferred back to the city and it hasn't been used uh, as originally proposed, then the city has to reimburse that back to the federal government. It, it, actually, and I'm going to let Mr. Baldwin speak, because he and Mr. Um, <coughs> Prime are our experts. Mr. Baldwin, would you speak to, um, and he has been working on, the, on, on this project. Good evening. Mm -hmm. um, it all really depends you know, the, on uh, when the property was acquired and what the national objective was the used national objective. for which the property was acquired. So for example, if the property was acquired for uh, low moderate income housing, there are rules related to that. If you acquire the property for slum and blight removal, there are rules related to that. So if you uh, take the property and you want to move it to some other use, for example, when that property went to uh, Wendy's, when you're taking it away from a national objective, the HUD requirement is to reimburse HUD at um, fair market value. So you have to determine what fair market value is. That money goes back to HUD, and generally they, they uh, have taken that money and it rolls back over to the city's CDBG account. So it kind of comes back to you. But there is a repayment required in those circumstances. Of Let me ask you this. But in the case of Wendy's, uh, that was purchased privately, so those funds from Wendy's were used to pay back exactly. the feds. But in exactly. this case, if it's just handed well, back Well, what you have to work with is depending on, again, these properties been, as Dr. Patton was um, indicating, properties been acquired over a number of years. There's all sorts of different um, rules that might have been in place at the time they were acquired. We have to work through all of those kind of issues. Generally speaking, um, yeah, the, the, the expectation from HUD is that the property is being used for the purpose for which it was acquired. And when you told them we're acquiring property for doing, let's say out at Westbury for low, low modern income housing, the expectation that's what the property is used for. If you decide to use it for something else, then you have to go back and take a look at, sometimes, for example, you could convert it over to another uh, a national objective, and you might not have to pay for that. But if you're trying to go back and say commercial use, 
Um, and, and then the last thing, kind of getting to your point, there are potential, and I just said there's an exposure out there. If you've acquired property and did not use it for the reason it was intended, then you get an audit, for example. Uh, it's possible that HUD could ask. Now, we haven't had that question come up in any recent years, but they could ask you what, what your intentions are with this property you acquired for a certain purpose and didn't use it for that, but still sitting vacant. Um, so that's a, that's a long list of properties you have there. So, some of those are uh, properties that do have development potential for, for a variety of different uses, and some of those are bits and pieces of properties that are sort of left over from other projects. So there's a whole variety of issues related to all those properties there. And so is there a statute limitations as far as once the funds are given um, has to be developed? Well, and the and a lot of the a lot of the properties were they were acquired years ago. There was there was no limitation on that. In fact, a lot of times I would tell I don't know if HUD even has a record that you <laughs> you have them unless you tell them you have them. We obviously have records of how they were acquired. Uh, newer properties, yeah, HUD has a much more restrictive time frame. They want you to be you know uh, using the property if you're not intending to use it. They don't want you to be land banking or so acquiring for property just sort of hang on to things. So if I understood what you just said to answer his question, there's a sunset provision for some of these. There can be, yes. It's got to be done completed by. They want you in a timely fashion. The intent is to do it in a timely fashion. So anything you require, for example, today, they want you to have a timely use of the yeah. property. Some of the things we've had hanging around there, I think some of those things on that list probably date back Seven. Four, four or five decades. Mm -hmm. and, and those so properties. do we know our exposure, the amount that the city is exposed to with the sunset uh, limitation? Um, we do not. We haven't, we haven't tried to calculate any exposure, any exposure to that. Um, yep. It'd be, be nice if we could uh, get this list drilled down to uh, developable. Uh, property to see what yeah. home and, there and, is possibly and then see what the uh, potential tax value assessment value uh, would be. Can, and I will just we, mention uh, we have been working on that exact kind of a project. We've mapped them all. We, we sort of know where all the properties are, and you can see the bits and pieces from the ones that may have some development potential. And that's a part of a project we've been. Taking us a little longer than we would like, but that is a, pro a project we're working on. So we'll be getting that list to, to show the developable parcels uh, and their. We could get that, but they're still working on it. Yeah, their assessments. It's a work yes. in progress. Okay. Before I recognize you, but to follow up on Bill's question, I think it would be good too to identify what bucket of money that particular property was acquired with, you know, if it was blight removal. Mm -hmm. Well, as opposed to, we don't have I can tell you a lot of that we don't know. Right. We don't there are no know. records. records. There are no records until. I mean, at that point. Yeah, there's no records of. But we've done what we can. We actually have the list. We can show the ones uh, we've been working with. Those have been a cooperative uh, project with PRHA, and we've had them provide what they um, have in their records. So we have it listed in our database. You know, what properties were acquired for what purpose for the most part. Uh, but there's a number of properties out there that there's just no record. No one could recreate 1978 all over again. Because the entire database was PRJ. The city had yeah, no so. involvement in CDBG funds up until the so, 90s. So we do carry, obviously, the, uh, the assessor's office, for example, carry ownership. <laughs> but a lot of times we don't know exactly how the, how, you know, what the act was. And for example, and some are more are, are complicated. Just if you look at the Wendy's, I think it's a prime example. You had, um, I'm trying to remember, Brian, it was 15, 13, 15 parcels, whatever it was on the Wendy's. 11, and, and there was a mix. Some of them were CDBG acquired, others were purchased with other funds wow. that were not CDBG uh, related. So we had to go through a process mm -hmm. to separate the CDBG acquired from the non-CDBG acquired and separate the funds that went back to the CDBG account from the ones that went to PRHA for, for their reimbursement. So you have some of those things out there as well. So it's a lot more complicated than, than it may sound um, when you go through that full list. Yeah, um, two of the, um, the properties on here, number two and number 88, they have um, structures on them, a parking garage and uh, a residential infill lot. I mean, right. So we and are I think, again, I think you'll find a lot of cases where the city, again, working with PRHA, there's properties which city facilities are located on properties that are <coughs> still carried under the PRHA, um, under the tax assessor's records. Right. All of that's mixed in there as well. So we will be able to, I mean... You can see all of you can see all of that, but there is again as Dr. Pat was with. There's a lot of that sort of mixing 
a lot of it was done in a collaborative fashion where the PRH was acquiring on behalf of the city for a city project as you might have a city structure sitting on it. And the property may have never changed hands from PRHA to the city, for example, for whatever They're reason. managing a garage on one of these. <coughs> So it's they would want the city to right. take that over? Is that the transfer? Well, that's part of what you'd look at. What's the, what's the, what was the intent for these things? And you'll see if there's a fair amount of that downtown, that kind of a arrangement. And, and this team has been working on this project over a year and a half, trying to sort out these properties. Can you help us with the color code? I'm going to ask Brian, since Brian, uh, Brian's, Brian's my go-to person for this. He put it together for me. Obviously a long list. Uh, what we've attempted to do, uh, as there are almost 100 uh, pieces of property, individual lots, is uh, we've, we've worked to color code those. So each uh, color-coded uh, selection there is an actual development site. So you may have four parcels that make up a development mm -hmm. site. And that, that's like the Wendy's, yeah. the Wendy situation. You might think of a lot of parcels, but sometimes they're very small pieces that make up a, a larger part. If they're grouped in one particular color, does that mean that the lots are contiguous? They, in most cases, are. They are. Uh, there are cases to complicate matters further where the city may own a, a lot right in the middle of the block. So um, in those cases, it's, it's technically a development site. Uh, but uh, in 99% of the cases, they're contiguous. Yes, sir. Could you explain what a BNO code is? Do you want to talk about it? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, speaking to CDBG, uh, the BNO code is the uh, broad national objective. Uh, Mr. Baldwin had uh, spoken earlier about uh, the disposition of property needing to meet a, a broad national objective. So uh, to the extent we have been able to identify uh, the national objective that was uh, determined when the property was acquired, uh, some cases going back to the 80s or even further back, uh, we have included that. So uh, where you see a BNO code of uh, SBR, that would represent slum blight removal. Okay. Uh, Can you just go down the list and tell us what the acronyms are? Sure. Uh, initial. LMA would be a, a low mod area, a national objective, benefiting uh, low income persons. Let's uh, distract. is a uh, LMH is low mod housing. Uh, you also have an SBA code that is a slum blight area. And um, I think the final code would be. Uh, the ABDN, which uh, represents a, uh, a abandonment of the broad national objective. Um, I believe in that case the uh, acquisition funds have been repaid back to HUD in that scenario. Oh, so there's no liability under AD, ABDN? Is that what you're saying? Yeah. Other, other than doing any advertisement or anything else that would be required by HUD. Correct. Yeah, oh, yeah, just tiny things. Can I get clarification on if it's abandoned, if it has abandoned the broad national objective? Are you saying that there is no liability on the part of the city to have to repay that back, or there is? Uh, there may be some HUD regulations that would still apply, but whether or not that would come down to a repayment of funds, uh, I would not be able to answer that. It's, it's really specific to the property. It's so is that, is that what the city is trying to determine? That's part of what we're trying to determine. Okay. Now, the in that one, case, HUD, HUD has recognized that the national objective is not is no longer applicable to those yeah, properties, but it doesn't necessarily mean there's no well, okay. financial liability. 100%. That's part of what we're working for. And, and let me just say, it's, it's no fault of anybody around this table. They were brought so many years ago, I don't think any of us was involved when this happened, but just something that we got to get our hands around. We need to. We yeah. it day yeah. when yeah. I came in. Yeah. The uh, abandoned properties in Craddock, yeah. uh, the residential infill lots, are, are those that uh, are those the ones that we are paying back uh, the CBDG monies? Those were those funds were already paid back, um, and at the time of the of the disposition of that, the uh, city I think gave those parcels to PRHA. But those were no those are PRHA properties, free and clear. There's been some discussion about who wants them, but HUD has been 
hey, the city repaid them with um, non fiscal I guess that was 2014 time frame. Okay. But, but there's no liability left. It was just a two, question. Two years ago. Yeah. About two, so, three years ago. Yeah. So yeah. on the last page, all the purple that's in Craddock, there's no further obligation to us. I'm not sure if that's all of those parts, because those, those are on a variety of streets. This looks like these are all on one. All on Cushing Street. On Cushing. Yeah. We'd have to, I think we'd have to take a look at that one. But I do know on the ones that were under the CDBGR program, that was the one that we did the repayment on. That was a separate other pieces. Uh, revitalization program at the time had a hard deadline. We have a problem in the city, a phenomenon of um, big lots like in old neighborhoods like Holland Biltmore uh, with a small house. A person comes in, buys the house, and then um, subdivides the lot. And where there was one, there's now three. Um, this is a two-part question. Can we solve that with our new zoning ordinance, number one? We will solve yes, that. Yes, yes. Number two, how could that work here in Craddock, or can it? Well, I think the lots in Craddock are, for the most part, buildable lots. They're in historic districts. There's a lot of, of authority granted right. to the um, Historic Preservation Commission to work through that issue. I don't think that's a... Uh, sort of apples and oranges on those two okay. things. But to your, to your first question, that is definitely a zoning ordinance fix. That we are working on. Everybody from that up all over. Yeah, a lot yeah. of that's going on. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And we, I can tell you from, you know, I've signed a lot of plats. Um, can we? Either creating an extra lot or vacating lots because. Can we just pause for a second and get a temperature reading of council? Is that a concern to? Yes. 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 We agree 100%. Yes. 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 All right. That's a concern, but when I, when I see 35 foot wide lots as new lots, yeah. that's a concern to, to everyone, I think, in these neighborhoods because they weren't platted that way originally. Dr. Bass. Um, it was um, safety town, safe, uh, safety day or whatever. We were out um, and coming back, I just saw all these houses like I'm in this house, but I could look in your window because there's a house there, there's a house there. And I came back and said to Mr. Baldwin, how could these houses, and he says, Dr. Patton, based on our zoning code, they could do it. And they don't have to come forward and they can just build. So immediately he said, but we're working on it. And what we're redoing, that's going to come before council. So it's a, a lot of analysis to go through all those neighbors and see which ones have that and which ones don't, because it's not universal. But we are it is definitely one of the top priorities to, to work on, to get it straight. And we are well aware of it. All right. Everybody mm -hmm. on board? Mm -hmm. Okay. So what is the resolution for this document? I mean, what? It sounds like a mess. Um, <laughs> did you say what, Mayor? I didn't hear what you said. Well, where are we going with this document? Um, the team has been working on this for a year and a half. Uh, when Mr. Bland came in immediately, he said to me, Dr. I want to give you some property. I already knew what he was talking about. And I said, there's no property here for you to give. In addition to um, what um, Dr. Whitaker asked about what's liability, not only liability, but the maintenance of all these parcels. You're at, you would be adding additional maintenance of 100 and something or whatever the parcels are. I think that where we should go is first as they are looking, what are the big developable pieces that can be considered for a significant development project? And identifying those that EDA or whomever group can work to try to get a development interest or put them out there for development. And I would ask the team if we could move as hastily, and that team consists of both Mr. Donahue and our team on this side, to see what those projects, what those pieces are, and we bring that back in the upcoming year before council for discussion and consideration. But we're not saying here tonight, uh, Mr. Bland, that we're <laughs> taking the hundred and pieces of property, but that is what I would propose to members of council. <laughs> Who's maintaining the, the, the lots? Oh, we are. They are. We are. It's their, they the ones bought them. Okay, so they've been maintained by the right. housing authority. Mm -hmm. That's right. All right. 
Dr. Ware, Whitaker had his hand up first. How are these parcels uh, presently marketed to the public as being available? The ones that are in, <clears throat> so the commercial properties, uh, we and industrial properties, we market uh, through our commercial real estate uh, broker, uh, which is Navarro Real Estate. Uh, they have the properties listed. Uh, and again, we're, we're focusing on those larger uh, properties that are on the list. Uh, residential properties, uh, we uh, market those in-house. Uh, we have signage up on the properties uh, that are really the key properties. Uh, I think somebody had mentioned Parkview. We have a number of lots in the Parkview neighborhood. Um, we also advertise through the Housing Authority's website. Uh, there is an available property inventory that we maintain and update regularly uh, that is available at prha.org. And um, you know, get lots of phone calls. We get uh, phone calls every day. Uh, it's very seldom that they pan out and actually materialize into a true project. <clears throat> yeah. Yes, sir. I, this may not be a popular comment, but I would like to see as we come back with what you're discussing, Dr. Patton, a, a list of these particularly larger and commercial, commercially developable sites to look at putting them back together with the Economic Development mm -hmm. Department of the city. I think it's confusing to the public at, at large and the development community to say, gee, that looks like a good spot for my hotel or store, whatever. I wonder who I should call. Should I call PRHA? Should I call the city? Should I call Economic Development? I, our Economic Development, particularly on the commercial side, to me, ought to go through Mr. Moore, period, the end. The whole world ought to know mm -hmm. he's the guy. Um, and I, I think it gets, when it's fractured, um, I, I think it's confusing to the the buying public of developers. Um, and, that's, and I know in, in the Economic Development Authority meetings, which um, I've been a liaison to for quite a few years now, you know, uh, Without fail, something comes up that, oh, well, no, that's, you know, I mean, even as silly as, as where Kroger is, you know, so you got the city developing one corner and you got PRHA developing the other corner. Mm -hmm. Well, that's crazy if you're mm -hmm. Wendy's or Applebee's or whatever. Why should you have to go to two places to decide where to put your restaurant at, at one intersection at, that, when it's all city entities, so to speak, mm -hmm. from the viewpoint of the outsider? That's, I'm Good point. Yes, I, yes. I agree with that 100 yeah. percent. Me too. That, what, when and how can we make that happen? Dr. Water. Well, in this instance, and, and I, I agree that um, it is some um, confusion there, but in this instance, since it is owned by PRHA, um, it's for PRHA to market, but however, wouldn't it be in the city's interest to also be involved in uh, marketing this property since there could be some repercussions um, with liability issues against the city? I don't, I don't see why it could not be a joint marketing effort on the part of the city or either the city um, take over the marketing of it However, the PRHA would still be responsible for maintaining it. I, I don't know what kind of discussions have been had in that regard, but I, I do agree that can, if, if persons are looking to develop properties in the city, I think they would normally look to economic development. And so I don't know if it could be a joint or either the city takes over some aspect of it without taking on the liability issue of ownership. It sounds like to me we're developing a consensus on this. Yes. Uh, Nate, do you have any comments or Vice Mayor? No, I would agree with everything that's been said. You know, it is possibly confusing to developers and people wanting to purchase the land. Just some way that we just need to work better. You know, our two bodies working together as a team, and that's what we're doing here tonight. To figure that out. Right. I think Devaris, if Devaris represents PRHA, Devaris also went through a very lengthy and competitive bidding process with the Economic Development Authority and happens to represent Portsmouth's Economic Development Authority in the EDA commercial properties. But that might not always be the case. Next time it gets bid, it might be different. Um, so then you got who's paying Devoris a commission for selling, you know, the corner. Bruce? Yeah, before we go too fast down this path, I, I know from a financial standpoint, 
there's there's flow of funds that come through us that are necessary to run PRHA and the housing authority and the housing that we have. You know, we we'd be foolish to think that all our funding comes from HUD or all our funding comes from some source. It is a synergistic set, set effect of where our money comes from. So, Mr. Blan or, or, or even Scott, I guess I'm looking here before we, there's no doubt there needs to be collaboration between ourselves and EDA on who is the face on commercial property. There's no ands as buts about it. But, you know, let's peel that onion back to make sure once those those properties are sold, we, we talk about the property across from Kroger. You know, that was obviously public housing at one time. You know, it, it, it kind of fell on us whether we wanted to or not. Sure. That, and there's a, the way the funds come back to us is necessary for the operations of RHA. To, to have that. So, again, let's let's make sure we walk this dog carefully before we just make a blanket statement. A, you know, all commercial properties should be run through this sort. It, it it may be as far as the face to the, the commercial entity, all right. But where the how the funds are handled and, there. And I don't know. There careful. may be three. There may be thirty. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, I think well, that's. I, th I, think, I think I think it's a difference between ha having one point of contact though, and the funds. I, sure. I, I mean, uh, Mr. Moore is the. Uh, you know, he's economic development. He he can he can be the sales person, if you may, and the marketing person. But uh, once the sale is made, it, it can certainly be understanding of where those funds uh, end up. Well, it appears to me that we're c all these comments complement each other because yeah. that certainly complements yeah. what what's been said. Yeah, yeah. sure. It's, it, it would be a win-win for both yeah. because um, PRHA would receive whatever. Uh, funds would come from the sale, and the city is no longer on the hook for any possible liability. So, again, there's just those things that I'm just not uh, uh, enough to talk about. You know, there's all kinds of tax credits that are available through us, through our sources. That's not available, possibly through the city. So, you know, let's let's make sure we walk this dog carefully. We're not leaving money on the table that would be good for the city. That PRHA does have access to that maybe the city or, or economic development doesn't doesn't necessarily have. So, but again, it's a great topic, and as, as we're trying to say, we have 96 pieces of property that we we want to get on the we definitely want to get on the tax roll, mm -hmm. and we're just asking for that help to do it with. Yeah. And Dr. Pat. I think one of the, one of the things we could look at, and I have. I've mentioned this before, and we have met with the city, we've worked with the city, and we have a person uh, who has um, completed all the research, and that is Hampton's relationship of their authority with development and um, their city. And they are a model, and they're right next door to us across the water. And uh, we would be very interested in sharing with us, the director, of how they move from where we are now mm -hmm. to where they are. Mm -hmm. And I, I, uh, this I started in, in 2015 when Mr. Moody brought it up in a discussion. And we've moved all the way. We've got, we've got everything. We know how they did it. They're, they, the two bodies work together every year in a retreat, come up with what their strategic plans are, their goals as it pertains to development, what both bodies agree. And that financing piece is in there. What goes back over here, what? And I would recommend that we, and we're saying we'd like to have a retreat, we be ready at the retreat time, I've shared this with mm -hmm. Mr. Bland, to have that body to come and present to us just how they did it mm -hmm. and how it has worked for them. Yeah. Uh, Ribbon. Yes, I, I think it, it's incumbent upon us to make sure that whoever the customer that comes to us, we make it as seamless, seamless as possible for them to do business with us. And I think that we are Portsmouth, whether we're PRHA or, or the city, we are Portsmouth. And we want and we are inviting people to come and do business with us. So let us do the work for them rather than them having to jump through hoops to do what they want for us. And as seamlessly as we can make this for them, we can talk about this. but. They shouldn't have to feel frustrated and unable 
to do the good things for our great city, to make our city an even greater place for business for the world. Um, I'm, I think that's what we are really saying here. I don't think nobody at this table is saying anything different from that. This is kind of like, how do we make that happen for them? Because we are inviting them to our city. And we want them to stay here forever. Good point. OK, thank you, Mr. Uh, Bia. Thank you, sir. Um, well, do we have a takeaway here on at least one item that we jointly market? Uh, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> that edge piece on Frederick? Yeah, the, and work out the details. I mean, that's, that's, because it's incumbent upon us to make it happen. Uh, yes, well, that's on Effingham. That's, I've been there for uh, making for a number of years. What is the Effingham? That's where, where, where yeah. the pawn shop is. Yeah. Or was. Mm -hmm. yeah. So the I know where, where, no, I don't know where he's speaking. Okay. Right there at High and yeah. High and Effingham. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, that's the piece. Yeah. yeah. That that is a piece. We need to market that. Mm -hmm. But you have a project. There's a but. There's a but there, and I'll let Mr. Um, Ball would say what the butt is at this point. Well, this at this stage of the game, there is a proposed um, project in that in that location that came th um, through PRHA, and the applicant has come back over to the city to build. Um, um, I guess I call it um, low moderate income housing with a commercial first floor over there. They've been through the city's um, on that design review on on that highly on that traveled <laughs> valuable. <coughs> piece and, of real estate, and we are we are waiting them for them to submit their use permit that, application. That, that is that is not the highest and best use of, the, of that property. I'm sorry, it, it is not. Low income housing on, on yeah, Effingham at the corner of Effingham and High Street. Not no. low income workforce. No, not low income. Well, I, I don't care what it is. It, it, that's commercial. That's commercial property. On the full tax rolls. Okay. I think what you're debating is the use of the land. The, the use of the land. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Market yeah. Study. Sir. Is there a market study? Is there a market study? Mm -hmm. well, let's, let's share our conversation mm -hmm. amongst ourselves. <laughs> <laughs> I can, and we and we're, we're, we're being real open and candid. I'll let Mr. Moore well, share. That's the purpose. I'll let Mr. Moore share what his findings were on and the interest on that property. Prior to us learning that PRJ was looking to put the housing development. Mr. Moore, please come okay. forward and speak. And as he, as he moves to that point, to pick up on Can you move? both of you are saying, okay. one of the complaints I hear is a lack of a grocery facility That's in the commercial doing. business district. Mm -hmm. What's the prospects of, what's the probability of getting such a retail establishment there? Okay. Well, first let me say thank you, Mayor, Vice Mayor, members of council for allowing me to speak. Certainly, there are opportunities. We see that corridor, as um, Councilman Moody stated, as a um, highly visible corridor coming directly off of the interstate um, around F or down Effingham. We consider that to be a gateway corridor into our city. Mm -hmm. uh, I can tell you that we have had interest from that very use, a uh, grosser use um, on those properties. I can't tell you who exactly, but I can tell you that type of use has been um, inquired about and we have been working on. Um, certainly that was prior to learning what was going on uh, with uh, PRHA. Um, so we are working, we are still moving forward. Um, that project has not, has not come through as of yet and we'll keep working a deal until there's no longer a deal. Uh, but at this point, yes, we have had interest on a number of different commercial entities or types of uses, but a grocery store near downtown has certainly been an option. And that property has been an interest, but when we found out that the apartments were moving forward, then we over here can't, haven't been able to move it to get there. That's, that's why, why we have. That's why we're here. Yeah, yeah. I was saying, this is exactly yeah. why we're needed. Exactly why we're here. It's needed. Yep. So, what's what's your reaction as a group to this? I think it would be it would be a great use of the property, 
it's uh, sometimes we're dealing with a scenario where um, there isn't a an interested developer. Mm -hmm. If no one's interested in developing a property, we can know what we want, you know, all day long, but it, it's not going to happen just because we want it. I think, like Dr. Whitaker said, if the uh, market study has shown what is the best use of that land there, that's what we need to focus on. And if we have two options, you know, and if the grocery store is the one that, that's most needed for that area, that's the one that we need to move forward with. Um, so we need to get to the table. Mm -hmm. Yeah, It's definitely a food desert, but, you know, it's also in like one the of the term. worst, mm -hmm. you know, tra high traffic areas mm -hmm. as well. So does that make it move better or worse for worse. the traffic. developer? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I can tell you if you're specifically talking about that site, that site provides a potential user, I'll say at this, at this instance, three entrances mm -hmm. into that site, yeah. um, depending on, you know, the opportunities that you have surrounding that property. Um, so potentially, you know, we're, we're talking about potential. It, it's that is a highly you know valuable as it is. But I think the the growth and opportunity is, is a lot larger. Chris. Uh, We've just presented to you CDBG properties. All right. There's others, and I think it's good that we're having this dialogue, there's other properties that we have available to us. And I think what you're asking, I think what we're all asking to do is we, we need to be, and I guess we're asking for the cooperation of EDA from the city, that we've got to sit down all of us and look at all the properties that we have available for the best of the city. So while, we're, while we may be pigeonhole in one piece of property, and that may look as the most attractive right now, there may be other pieces of property that truly, you know, EDA ought to be involved. And, and it appears to me in the short period of time I've been on the commission, we just haven't asked, mm -hmm. all right? And now it's time for, for to ask. Is this what you want us to do with this property, or what? What do we plan to do with this property? Because if you're just finding out now that we're putting, you know, mm -hmm. housing on that property and there's a better use, shame on us. Mm -hmm. Shame on us. All right. Okay. And uh, I think the the commission we're, we're we're ready, and that's why we're here. Okay. Bill. No, I I agree with what uh, Bruce just said. He parallel what I was going to say. It's a prime example that uh, uh, you know, shame on us. Uh, collectively. Totally, collectively, mm -hmm. that uh, we're not communicating. H mm -hmm. Here we uh, discover that you're working on a project that uh, I just learned about, mm -hmm. and probably my colleagues as well. And uh, we got too much at stake not, not to think these things through and, and make all of us aware of it. Old saying, uh, you, you know, all of us is a lot uh, smarter than uh, a couple of, of us uh, applies here. Is there a way that we can put the residential uh, proposal on a pause and let um, let the group uh, pursue a commercial development there? I think that's why we're here tonight, because the housing authority, we want to make sure whatever we're doing is going to fit what the city wants. Right. Uh, that's the most important yeah. thing, uh, that the housing authority want to be a part of what's going on. Partner. A partner what's what's going on. Well, so everything, nothing it, it had been confirmed. So that, and I think the dialogue that we're having tonight is very good. Uh, we have learned a lot, we have talked a lot, and I think in the end we can accomplish exactly what the city wants. I think, you know, that's the most important thing. To pick up on what um, Bob Baldwin said, it sounds like this is on a faster track, mm -hmm. and maybe it's really important for us to pigeonhole this particular property at this mm -hmm. time. Is there a consensus amongst the two bodies that we <coughs> seek commercial development there first? Yes. 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 The only question I had was, they said it was the the bottom was going to be commercial, and then housing above it. What type of commercial was discussed at the bottom? <clears throat> well, let me just um, answer your question. The, the zoning in that district requires the first floor to be commercial, so the design they have presented shows the first floor as commercial. What it would be, I don't think they've got a 
uh, of a user in, in mind for that. They just have been required as they've been going through our uh, Historic Preservation Commission for design to put commercial design on the first floor. Well, that's, you know, I was just thinking if the first floor was a grocery store, then we would get both if it was possible, but it just depends on if you had the right people that would want to do that. Um, you know, that could be a challenge, though, because most of the grocery stores look for some type of iconic-looking yeah. feature. Mm -hmm. And uh, Norfolk tried that uh, on Bush Street, and right. it didn't work. It, it, it works quite well. To, to be I, I just mentioned, just you can imagine, there'll be a, a, a parking challenge for the two. Not, not that we're not looking forward to solving it, but you would have a lot of demand for parking, and for potentially enough to generate the need for some sort of a structured parking, which that's okay too. I'll just point out sure. that's a parking takes up a lot of a lot of land when you do that, but. Well, I'll ask my question again. Um, do we have a consensus amongst the two bodies that we pause the residential uh, proposal and focus uh, on a commercial development on this particular piece of property? Yes. Yes. My only concern is um, what Ms. Roberts raised, and um, that is the, the property has been sitting there all this time. Mm -hmm. Since 1989. Acre, and there hasn't been a commercial tenant that has shown any mm -hmm. interest. Mm -hmm. and Ag actually, actually, there was, uh, there was, uh, there was, one, there was an IHOP that, that wanted to uh, locate there. Now that you have one. <laughs> Um, I don't know how I don't know how far in the process PRHA is with it, but uh, I don't know how much more of a focus when we say that we're going to put on developing it if uh, this commercial person isn't interested. Mayor, uh, Mayor, Vice Mayor, uh, okay. and then Bill. Uh, and two, two things, Mayor. I know um, Bill was talking about that, but there was another development, major development plan for that site, but they wanted the. You'll probably remember they wanted the um, pawn shop, hmm. and they thought they had a deal to get the pawn shop, and then the, no, the, they didn't get the pawn shop. So, so the whole thing, the whole thing shop. fell fell through. I just happened to know because I was chairman of the planning commission at the time. Mm -hmm. um, but my other thing is, I know that the deputy for um, PRHA, deputy director, comes to EDA meetings. Is anybody from EDA that goes to PRHA meetings? No, no. So, 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 Never so maybe um, we, we we need to do that. Start doing that, and have those persons who go to those meetings just say what the new the new th the new things are, to, to to make sure that everybody knows. Don't have to give the details, but you know, we just got proposal today for X use on this lot, and and then th that's th going to involve allowing. Those liaison members to go to closed session. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, 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 so be it. At least, at least, at least for that part. To, to, if, if it's not, nothing else but to say what they are about to do, and they can leave for the rest. Of, but because you're never going to get this group together every month to have these kind of discussions. But if, if you got two high-level people in both those departments, mm -hmm. uh, and they don't get much higher than the deputy, deputy director, uh, except for you, of course, uh, I think that, that solves some of your problems and, and, and communication problems. Uh, or, or, or other, other than that, you have to have a, a member from one board attend the other board's meeting, which we did 15, 20 years, 20 years ago when, when I first started serving on board's commission 20 years ago. We, we, we actually did that. But something, something of that nature so we all know what's, know what's going on and we won't have to, because this just won't happen every month to do this right here. This is great. But in the meantime, you still can do this every quarter or however you're often, but in the meantime, have those persons who are responsible come to the meeting and just listen in and then hear something and say, hey, wait a minute, you know. All right, wait a minute. Bill had his hand up, uh, and then, then uh, Vice Mayor pretty much uh, mentioned it. That the IHOP, uh, we we the IHOP that wanted to build there ended up being on Frederick because we had a higher uh, use for it, which was the project that the Vice Mayor just mentioned that uh, uh, that that was on schedule for there, uh, pending uh, additional parcels that didn't come through. Okay, Dr. Washington. I just want to add to what Bruce also suggested there are other parcels of lands that may may or may not be more attractive to some of these other commercial uses usage for usage also uh, this is a good thing but I think that in lieu of long periods of time that these lands have gone unused 
we want to make use of those lands. And in the spirit of PRHA for the city, we want to make use of these lands for, for the city and for the people of the city. And so when we, we have these dialogues and these conversations, we want to continue in making use of these resources to better our city. I would piggyback what the vice mayor just said. Um, other jurisdiction I worked in, normally we would have the person from the robber type person be coming to the house with all the meeting because that person really would know everything that's going on. Um, and I, you, what you're saying, I, I really think we need to have either Rob or his, uh, or his deputy coming to the housing authority meeting because they, they, they deal with development every, every day. day and they know all the rules and regulation. I think that's very important. Yes, sir. And, and this particular uh, parcel is a community block grant parcel? Yeah. Yes, sir. Yes, okay. most of it is. I, Mayor, Dr. Pat. Okay. Uh, go ahead. Um, since we're talking about um, things, well, well, let's. It's on this issue. On this piece of this property. property. <laughs> this property. Uh, it's not on this property. All right, well, let's let's make okay. sure that we have a consensus. Then. Okay. And I'm looking at not only my colleagues on council, but our friends on the on the board. Do we have a consensus that we're going to uh, pause the residential proposal? and focus on a commercial uh, effort. Mm. Yeah. Um, are you saying commercial only? Because the example that we were um, working through at PRHA was a combination. Mm -hmm. Mixed use. A mixed use. Yes, sir. And I thought your point earlier was good, uh, but the market has changed. I'm thinking about these pocket grocery stores that are now coming up that, that are almost like a full service store, mm -hmm. yet they are much smaller in footprint, much smaller in parking, and I'm not sure that we've ever had that uh, concept in, in our downtown. And not to, not to mention a name, but I would pick a, an Aldi's, for example. Mm. And I would think, I mean, not knowing exactly the size of the lot, that it could still be a mixed-use development, but um, I would imagine that all these would be pretty particular as to which corner they would want to be on if it was, in fact, an all these. So, so my question, again, uh, how far is PRHA, PRHA into this process to pause it? have a letter of intent, so I think we, would, we do need to consult with legal counsel before yes. we can just say yeah. um, yes. we need to put a pause on this. Mm -hmm. So I think we need to get back with our legal counsel and get back with you before we can say that. Yeah. I think what's important in, in what you're saying, Mayor, and what I'm saying, yes, I agree with, is it's a mixed-use development versus a strictly commercial development. So, you know, I, I expect the experts to tell me what's better. But I care about what is the commercial development, as opposed to the most of the mixed use stuff. We've my experience has been on my term on council has been we have housing and then we're going to have space for commercial tenants and uh, we don't know what that's going to be. It might be a dry cleaner, it might be a smoke shop, it might be a nail salon. It's going to be a couple little things we don't really know. That's not really important. We just want to collect rent. In this case, it's we want to know what the commercial space is going to be, and then, oh, by the way, there's going to be residential up above. Or the commercial besides. becomes more important. Or, or beside. Yeah, or part of, whatever. That That's, for me, I think, what we're saying as far as, well, you know, it's a major part. Effingham Street's a commercial garter. Bill. Yeah, you, you build space, and, and people are not going to come to it. Anybody of any substance uh, is going to want their own footprint and, and their own input on what the what the space is going to be. Uh, and, I mean, we're talking about a you know a 50, 60 year decision here, and uh, I, I I I'll hold out for commercial because that's what it that's what that property should be is commercial. 
and, and uh, you know, whether we can get Aldi's or, or another uh, grocery store chain, that, that would be top of my list. But uh, there are other entities, I'm sure, that would be attracted to the high visibility and traffic count in that area other than apartments. Uh, well, I think we acquired this property in 1989, so keep that in mind. We, we've, we've had it for a long time. Yeah. Um, and we've had very little interest, now. you know, in that property. Also, I do think that this is going before a planning commission next week. No. Uh, no, no, am I wrong? Is that? When okay. is it January? January. January, January. planning commission. Mm -hmm. okay. Let That's me tell you how later, important this is. Um, in 1972, the city of Norfolk, um, on a piece of property downtown had this idea that they wanted to develop a shopping mall. That mall did not come until the late uh, 90s, the early 2000s. So these things uh, take time. Mm -hmm. and, but the important thing is to have the vision and the stick to it to uh, hold that vision. And you know, the whole bit about retail is changing. Um, but we still have a need for, again, a grocery store. I don't mean just to pick on that, but mm -hmm. even that business is changing. Yes, it is. What, what is that property labeled as on the uh, comprehensive map? It's commercial mixed use. Yeah. So that fits within the, mm -hmm. the vision of what it was. Right, proposed. it was a recognition that was a historical commercial corridor. And so there's always been a commercial requirement. That's why the zoning mandates it on the first floor. And then it's mixed use, so you could put residential above. Okay. And the market study I was speaking to was that I'm quite sure the developer has done a market study on that property um, and has determined that that's uh, a highest and best use. Yes, the market study is required with the low income housing tax credit application. Also, I'm sure it's a use or demand for housing, you know, affordable housing. But that um, study, though, but you know, I'm, to say that that's a better use, I don't think that study addresses yes. that point of that. Yes. The study didn't say in the whole universe of, right. of uses what is right. the, the best Correct. use. Correct. Okay. It's just addressing the need for mm -hmm. more affordable housing in the city. Right. Affordable. All right. So it sounds like the majority <coughs> of agree that let's let's do what we can to pause this and to work our way through the details mm -hmm. and put the focus on a uh, iconic commercial piece still mixed use mixed use well not necessarily not if it's mm -hmm. purely commercial well PRHA can't act yet till they get yeah, with they legal counsel right on exactly that. but what we're doing is taking a temperature here and, and be mindful that the planning commission's charge is the highest and best use of the of the property. Part of it, part of their, their examination will, will be be that correct. That's right. So so that's that's some wickets to go through. No matter which way you go, whether you send it all commercial, you send it all mixed, still got to go through got to go through there, and, and they're gonna have to make a determination if, in their opinion, it's the highest and best use. And of course, I, I started to say we, but. but uh, you would get the final set. <laughs> we get the final, the final, the final, final set. Yeah. Yeah. If I might, just uh, you asked a question about process, and I want to make sure I verify all of our dates just to give you an idea where we are in the application. We have a, an application that's been submitted, and it has been before the HPC. Um, and I do need to go back and verify whether or not it got through the schedule, and we haven't finished our agenda for our December. I, mean, I just want to make sure that I verify that, that date. Um, whether it would, would still on track for December. I think there was a, a pause for the HPC process. Now we'll verify the date, make sure it's January, which is what I, um, I believe the track is on. But if it's December, we'll certainly let you know. And let me just make sure clear too. Um, is this workforce housing, low income housing? Because I keep hearing two, two terms being used, and I know they're different. Workforce, uh, workforce, count Dr. Whitaker. Okay. Can't make over 43.5. <coughs> Single. So it's income you limited. Can't make over. Yes. Yes. Yes, it is. We'll so in, in the spirit of full disclosure, um, as the liaison to the meeting, um, I, I was present when uh, the gentleman, the group came to make the presentation. So I would be interested in, you know, um, how we would reverse the situation. He seemed really adamant and, um, you know, gave us a really good um, 
plan um, presentation of it, um, the type of units that he's um, looking to invest there are similar to the one at Berkeley and yes, the banks at Berkeley. Main Street. Yes. Yeah, so I, I did go and take a look at that. It, it looks like it's a really nice um, unit, um, you know, set of um, units that are there. Uh, so I would be interested in finding out what the, um, the legal counsel would have to say about the letter of intent because you're reversing, you know, somebody, you know, you've had the property since 1989 and then you have an interested developer who, who comes on board and, you know, it's unfortunate we didn't have our economic Economic development, um, you know, department on board, and that council was a closed session item, so not privy for us to, to discuss in an open um, body, you know. So, um, you know, but we needed to have had this discussion six months ago. But now you have, you know, someone who's already submitted the use permit, and you know where you are on um, putting it on your agenda. You, somebody's got to go back to the table and tell this developer, uh, oops. You know, or whatever well, it, it is. Passed. Yes. Yes. Yeah. I, have to tell I, I, I would tell you. No, go ahead. <laughs> I would tell you just be mindful of whatever you do is going to be there for 50 years. Yeah. 50, That's 60 years. Uh, yeah. uh, you, you're going you're gonna to get you're going to get one shot at it. Well, us around this table. Thank. Maybe David might get two shots. The rest of us going to get get one shot at it, uh, and so you got to get it right uh, th this time. Uh, so, I would err on the side of getting it right the first time, as opposed to to rushing anything. And I can assure you that uh, when it goes through the wickets, the planning department and the and the planning commission are going to take a very thorough thorough review because they have no dog in the fight except for to see that it, to to give their opinion on what the highest and best use of the property is, and, and they will give you that, and then use. Um, six or left, uh, seven, uh, we, we, I guess it'll be soon. We'll, we'll, we'll make that final determination. But, but just be mindful, if, if, if it costs you a little time and $3 to get it right, I think you ought to take that time and spend $3 to get it right. Because our grandchildren are going to have to live with whatever the results are. But you may even have a grandkid by then, David. <laughs> <laughs> a young I think, one. I think we have a consensus. <laughs> Is it clear? I agree 100%. Yes. Okay. Now, Dr. Patton, you had another. Yes, I had. Um, Thank you, folks. Two, two items. One is um, uh, about six weeks ago, we spoke in regard to um, commissions and the authority and the desire to tape their, the meetings of the groups, of which we have put in place all of the um, direction that council has given us, but for us to. Um, be able to take PRJ, then we um, had recommended that the PRJ board meeting is held here in the, this conference room so it can be taped and available to the public. Um, so I just bring that back up during this discussion. It's enough room. Um, you don't have to stand. Uh, it's a lot of parking. And so I just put that out on, on the table as I thought been. we already did that and they were doing that. You, we you just talked about it they didn't. That's right. So, put so that. how do you all feel about that? Oh, I... I I think it's housing be authority. Yeah. Yeah. Oh. Y'all talked about that oh. at all? <laughs> <laughs> y'all know about this? <laughs> no. no. <laughs> we haven't. It's council's desire. We, we had discussed this, that, that your meeting should be televised because the work that you do is important and the public needs to know and, and wants to know. And we already have in place um, the equipment. And if you, let's say you had a public hearing that you needed to hold, you could actually use the council chamber. You know, it'd be worked out with the, with the city clerk on the calendar. I think we think there are pros and cons yes. mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. to the whole um, um, moving our meetings here because uh, when we're in the PRHA conference room, we have available to us all of the information <coughs> from our, the staffs and, the, and all of the people who are, are working on the behalf of the city to do this. And so to pull, to uproot all of that and and bring it here um, 
sort of um, it disconnects us from the actual work that's going on right there in that building. I don't know if there are any um, regulations or rules about where our meetings can be held because of our HUD connections and things like that that complicate. And I believe it's in our bylaws of Constitution, so we'll have to sit down and talk about it. But also, uh, Mr. Bland had brought it up that uh, we were looking into getting our own video equipment so we can broadcast wherever we are. So uh, that, that's on the table as well. And we also have some community space um, in some of our the housing um, Seaboard Square. projects yes. and, and things like that, which may put us in closer proximity to the constituency rather than, you know, I don't know. But we still want the public to see your meetings, oh, yeah. just That's like EDA and, we, and BPSC. Transparency. And we, yeah, and we, we, yeah. we have had um, taped meetings. It's not, that's not the case. Mm -hmm. It's, you know, sort of proximity to the constituency that is being served that's more of an issue, I think. But, you know, it is the city. We are a city body, but we just, just have this sort of overwhelming tie to the federal dollars that we receive from public the issues there too. And even if the city, if y'all got the equipment, because I know you have that department, right? If you want to set up a camera there when we do it, that's more than no, welcome we, to. No, we have it already here. We're not saying create or bring equipment. We use this facility I'm, for. Just it out there, Doc. That's okay, it. Yeah, I'm but this out, is the setting that we have all of the meetings for. We moved all of the meetings, the EDA, PPIC, and all, all got moved to this room mm -hmm. for this taping. reason. To, to use the equipment, to have the extra space for the public to sit, to have the kitchen available for the board if you have meals, um, to have the overflow to the council chambers and the restrooms in the hallway. So you all are the only board affiliated with the city that doesn't meet in this room now. I, I think we should be afforded an opportunity to discuss it That's right. okay. amongst ourselves mm -hmm. and then get back with you all mm -hmm. if, if you all will allow us to do that. Mr. Bland, you had talked about a retreat. It sounds like to me that, I mean, this is a nice coast group, but maybe we need to have the EDA as part of that. I mean, that, that adds um, about seven or eight more people. But this was, this thus far has been a great discussion. And what do you all think about having a, a three body retreat? Go to bite a wee and put us all together. Yeah. One one yes, of the, uh, we, we had a um, training, commissioner's training up in Pittsburgh. One of the things they suggested to us is that the more community agencies that are involved, excuse me, mm -hmm. are doing our training, thank you, mm -hmm. uh, the more community agencies we get involved with helping with the process and being involved with the process, uh, makes us more effective. So these kinds of collaborations are vital. Yes. And any other bodies that want to be with us, I'm bored. To start the conversation or pick up on what you have recommended, can we direct the city manager to work with the executive director of the Housing Authority to uh, work with the chairman of the EDA to come up with a possible retreat date and venue that's in town here uh, for late winter, early spring. Mm -hmm. Is that agreeable? Yes. Okay. Great. All right. Mr. Bland, uh, Chairman Smith, anything else? I have one more hand now. Yes, this sir. is just um, a a tip card that we created, and actually, <clears throat> this idea came from, uh, I was in South Bend, Indiana, at some meeting many years ago, and it was a tip card that they used to give to all the citizens that, with that tip card, they was able to pass information on to the police department when uh, <clears throat> illegal activities going on without, without providing the name or, or their uh, or the phone number address. And uh, some of the South Bend in there, they use that for all the citizens within the community, uh, where the where the car goes direct to the police department. Uh, we have it, we have it for the housing authority residents going to our security. Department. But that's just uh, a card that had been very effective uh, in some communities. 
in, in closing, like I said, I really appreciate this meeting. I think we accomplished, I feel we accomplished a lot tonight. Um, we know that we got to do more collaboration as a group, and I think by having the retreat is a great idea. And the more we can meet, I think we all have the end, end goal is to make the city of Portsmouth a, a much better place. I think we all want to accomplish that, and I feel that we're moving in the, in the right direction. I really appreciate the uh, council and the mayor inviting the housing authority to participate tonight. Uh, we really appreciate it. Thank you. Before we conclude, um, any other comments that anybody wants to make? Thank you. Mm -hmm. no, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. no, we yes, sir. Uh, from, uh, again, my, my perspective on the authority is from a financial standpoint and also with the housing standpoint. And I just want to make that comment publicly that while we're looking at development and the housing, the infrastructure behind, the staff behind has just been fantastic on the financial side. You know, we've heard right up front, clean audit, clean audit for many years, 23 out of 25 points on the, on the measures. PRHA, I, I think, has a very, very good handle where the money's coming from, where the money's going, and if it's properly spent. Most recently, we approved as an authority our internal control policies. We worked real hard on that. You know, given that we've had some speed bumps in the past, and we're very proud that we've been able to pass the staff those the internal controls that should be in place from a financial perspective. So, and what you're saying is that you actually have money that comes to you that does not come through the city council. It might be good to have a one or two page narrative on uh, that qualitatively describes what you just said. Could that be done? Can you and Mr. Bland yeah, work together? Where the money comes from and where it goes? Yes. Well, thank you again. Thank you for, especially for what you do, because you're volunteers. We <laughs> ask you to serve. We sure are. And uh, we greatly appreciate that. And thank you for meeting with us tonight. Thank you. All right, this part of the uh, Chairman Smith, you want to adjourn your meeting? Uh, the any in readiness? Meeting adjourned. <laughs> we still have work to do. You're welcome to stay. Dr. Pat? I'm gonna call. Yes, I'm well, let's take just a uh, five-minute uh, recess. I'm going to call me tomorrow. I'll get that to you. I appreciate it. Okay, I have a meeting tomorrow. Okay. Yes. I have never done more than No. No. This is good. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Uh, I'm already doing it. I see you more one. More. I told you that. Yeah, you told me. Yeah. Yeah. Come here. Give me a minute. Not that I know. You know, I don't know. 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 I know. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. I do I know. I I I I that you know, right. I know. I know. He can't believe it. I know. I'm sure. So, Mr. Winners, I'm even going to get some of Oh, y'all do? At 8 o'clock, 8 o'clock. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. We do have light uh, water and coffee. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Penn. Thank you. Thank you. How did we do? How did we do? fine, sir. Thank you. Good to see you. Always happy to hear that. Encouraging her. No, no, no. I'm just saying. Here, Dr. Washington. Yes, sir. Oh, yeah. No, no, no. No, that's what I'm saying. I just thought, 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 I
straight enough. Yeah. So, you ready, Miss? Oh, yeah, we got another meeting. That's the only, you know, bit of a concept. It's the only thing to be the same. Anyway, so that's But I don't know the geography there to try to pull that off. Your edge presentation. Um, no, you, you're talking. You're just going to I got one slide. He has one slide. Mr. Ashby. And I'll go stand up there right now. So we don't no, you don't. I got to read my thing. Because <laughs> I know there's been a couple of times. I've been yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, yeah. Well, you know, did you hear my point there? The guy went to about my voice. He used menthol. So they're really bad for your voice box. Be aware. Yeah, it's just one slide, but I'll come on. Yeah, well, let's not talk about it. Colleagues back in. Mr. Pace, could you go get our colleagues, the, the council persons back in because we're ready to start? I mean, we'll get two minutes. Here. <laughs> Uh, Mr. Moody. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Mr. Moody. Oh, Mr. Moody's back. Right. Mr. Chair. He's checking the council. It's kind of a cool well, uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Say, <laughs> darling, they want me to rattle somebody and they want me to spend 40 minutes. Right. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we'll come back to order. And Dr. Pat. Yes. Mayor, Vice Mayor, and members of City Council, this evening we have two presentations. The first, Mr. Solomon Ashby, City Attorney, will provide a timeline for the city's first wireless facility franchise agreement. Tonight's discussion is the fourth wireless franchise discussion before City Council as it pertains to the development of small cell infrastructure. As data bandwidth streams increase, small cell infrastructure will provide those high-speed connection access points. The second presentation, Mrs. Alice Kelly, Chief Financial Officer, will provide an update on the city's FY18 first quarter budget results and variances. A report on quarter, the quarterly budget review is on the table before you. Mr. Ashby. Good evening, Mayor, Vice Mayor, Council Members. The implementation of 4G and 5G wireless infrastructure continues throughout Hampton Roads and Portsmouth is no exception. As I previously discussed with you and as Dr. Patton has stated, the city attorney's office and the relevant departments have uh, negotiated the first small cell wireless franchise agreement for the city of Portsmouth. The staff has taken in, into account the council's concerns about the impacts of such agreements and developed an ordinance amendment and an agreement that best address those concerns within the confines of the law. Tonight, we will just present you the timetable for uh, the approval of the first small cell wireless franchise agreement. Uh, as you see here on December 3rd, we will publish a notice in the Virginia pilot for uh, what's called an invitation for bid as it relates to franchises and, the, and essentially the sale of property rights for the city of Portsmouth, you must have a bid process in accordance with uh, state code section 15.2. Uh, 2101 and 2102. So it's listed as an invitation 
forbid. Even though these agreements are not exclusive, uh, it is still will be structured as an invitation to bid. Um, we will have the bid and the public, uh, we will publish the notice on de December 3rd for the bid and public hearing uh, on the proposed wireless facilities franchise agreement. Uh, the form of the proposed agreement will be published on December 4th and made available in the clerk's office. And on December 12th, you will have the opportunity to accept uh, bids and have a public hearing on the proposed franchise agreement. At that same time, you also have the opportunity to consider approval of the franchise agreement as well as the code amendments um, that incorporate, um, if you recall, when we first had the discussion, we were talking about existing <coughs> polls and we had a certain <coughs> number of laws that came down in accordance with General Assembly Senate Bill 1282. In this amendment, we're now addressing new polls also. And so that's the purpose of the amendments that have been added also. Uh, and so that is the timetable we're addressing here. I will let you know that the discussion thus far has only involved one uh, particular company. And most of that discussion has been around placing facilities on existing polls. So we have not had some of the scarier scenarios we were talking about early on in the process. Uh, and so that is our timetable. Uh, I've provided you all some information and again, as of the third and the fourth, uh, much more information will be available to the public in terms of moving that process along. When's our council meeting in November? December 11th, 11th and 12th. 12th. And so if there are any questions, uh, if there are any additional issues, or should council want to um, uh, get, uh, uh, have a further discussion, you will have that opportunity on December 11th. Question. Yes, yes sir. And, and this may not be answerable tonight, but the whole national discussion now on net neutrality, uh, is that going to impact this? Dr. Whitaker, I'll tell you, I have not um, looked at that particular issue as of yet, but I will certainly, we'll, we'll make sure staff takes a look at it and see how that will impact the agreement. As I say here, I, I'm speaking in generalities here because this agreement has not been made public. Uh, but we will take a look, since we have a few days, to take a look at it and make sure there are no um, hidden issues with regard to where the country may go with regard to net neutrality in this particular agreement. But the proposed agreement becomes public on the 3rd? Correct. That's correct. And so at that point in time, you, can, you the council, have the full opportunity to delve into it in detail because it will be uh, published as of uh, the 3rd. Any further questions? So this is inviting uh, wireless facilities to a location or just well, the, over? The, pro the process, uh, much like you would do the bidding process for other procurement, um, state law places franchise agreements in that same, uh, under that same structure, although it's considerably different. Um, the bids would come to m my office to me. Uh, they will be announced open on the night of December 12th. However, you could have a bid today for X company and a month from now for Y company and Z company and that process would continue. It's not like we're selling a particular piece of property. We're selling access. Right. Uh, I'm going to ask a follow-up, which is, is there a ge geographic limitation on this franchise or is it citywide? Citywide. Citywide. It would be citywide. And does this tie into any of the broadband um, wiring, networking that's being discussed with the other cities? Certainly, and I'm, I'm going to look at Mr. Jones so he can tell me if I'm going too far afield. Certainly, it is the backbone structure mm -hmm. that provides that opportunity for a number of these connections as we go forward. Certainly, the, the, the private entities are uh, obtaining access to the roadway to lay their infrastructure mm -hmm. so that they can take advantage of 
increased opportunities as well as upgrade the opportunities for the citizens in the city. Yes, sir. So, so these different bids, um, I know we had discussed earlier about the necessity of having um, more transponder points or the 5G. Sure. So these potential bids could look totally different from um, bidder to bidder as far as how that's going to impact on these transponders throughout the city. Certainly. Certainly. We, And as I said, <coughs> thus far, the discussion with this first bidder, appears to be uh, one that's engaged in utilizing existing structures. We may have one that comes behind it that has an entirely different approach. Uh, but this is the first one uh, uh, out of the box. And right now, as I said to you all, we may have some different discussions as additional bidders come along. But from the time period we discussed previously to now, I'm, I'm a little surprised we don't have multiples in process. We just have the one. But our, our action on the 12th is to consider awarding and franchise to a particular company. Correct. That's not exclusive. Correct. And that cannot be transferred to another company uh, without our approval. Correct. That, 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 that a, it, another company would have to come in and get another franchise. Certainly. And, <coughs> and the only caveat I would put there, Mayor, is there may be, much like cable and fiber, there may be ability to lease or sub within that process. I don't want to say absolutely one person. But certainly there's an opportunity for other folks to come in and, and ask for a franchise also. Yes, sir, Bill. What, what happens if the uh, after the franchise agreement is awarded, uh, they don't live up to their end of the bargain. Uh, is there an out on our end? We, we certainly have uh, op we have language there for obsolete equipment, abandoning equipment where they're required to pull up their infrastructure if if it becomes a, a issue of them. Uh, abandoning or it becomes obsolete. They, there are obligations to pull that but down. Many cable franchise ordinances, though, had a, a milestone. You had to lay that much cable in six months, and this much in 12 months. Otherwise, council had the right to revoke the ordinance. And I'm going to ask Bill's question in a different way. Do we have a revocation clause in the ordinance for non-performing? And, and what I will do, Mayor, to, to lay out those particular elements, we can certainly, I can certainly provide you all of that relevant language. And then, if you'd like, we can certainly bring this back up to do the final review on the 11th with regard to those particular elements. Well, as one member of council, I think it's important that we have a revocation clause in Absolutely. the Absolutely. Sure. The ordinance. Absolutely. How do you all feel about that? Yeah. Definitely. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I will provide that to you um, uh, as soon as possible, and then we can pick up that discussion specifically on the 11th. Oh, no, Somebody, yes, sir. Just a question for the um, uh, our technology director. Um, is the 4G, 5G? Yes. Um, He's It's a real simple, the, the 4G, 5G, um, how is that different now from what we're seeing as LTE? 4G and 5G is just simply fourth generation, fifth generation. LTE is this long-term evolution. It's just an acronym for basically an in-between point between a 4G and a 5G. Okay, okay. Thank you. It's simple. Thank you. Mm -hmm. All right. Yes. I still don't know what he said. But right. anyway. <laughs> Come back, Mr. Please. <laughs> Say that again. 4G and 5G. Is 4G is the fourth generation of the technology. 5G is the fifth generation of the technology. But right now we're at the 5G. Everybody. No, no 5G has not been deployed as of yet. We're at 4G LTE, which is a stepping stone to get to 5G. So the future that we're looking at will be 5G. It'll be 5G, 6G, 7. It, it just keeps advancing as technology progresses. Is that like saying we have Windows 1.1 and 1.6 and, yes. okay. When we're speaking of the cars, 
and that's what we were talking with council before where we said we may have to have every so many feet one of these so that would be the 5g generation that we're talking about where there are going to be these cars that can drive by themselves absolutely that's where the 5g and the 6g would come in because at that frequency and spectrum the data bandwidth that can be transferred to support those applications it has to be that type of stream because as we alluded to in prior presentations as you take the 1g i'm sorry 1g up to the two and the three you can have a long signal strength but you can't transmit a whole lot of data at one time the 5g the signal strength is not as great 5g will be used as a capacity rather than a signal booster that you would say. So these will be located in the high density areas of where they have a lot of traffic that they cannot support the backhaul to get to the internet or to the data. It's deep. So, uh, so other areas will be either 4G or LTE? Right. Most of the areas now are 4G. Some of the areas are 4G LTE. It's just, like I said, an acronym for a, another evolution or a faster than 4G, but not at the point of 5G because the the advisory councils have not determined the actual speeds of what 5G and deployed the policies and procedures about. Okay. And with the use of the, the fiber optics um, um, networking, uh, because we're working with some of the other cities, um, Norfolk, Virginia Beach, okay. Chesapeake, um, I think mm -hmm. the, the city managers are meeting yes. together with water. some of that fiber optic technology to Absolutely. bring this into place. Because with cellular technology, you have the wireless to the access point, but you still have to have a wired fiber infrastructure to get the, as Mr. Right. Ashby, the backbone to the internet. Right. So as we're working with regionalism with other municipalities, creating our own network to lease and to backhaul some of this data for the providers, you know, enhances the connectivity for our citizens. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And we're preparing ourselves, Mr. Jones, for when out in the ocean, I mean, you know what I'm talking right, about. Right, yes. I'm not technology. Out in the ocean is um, the councilwoman speaking of, we're preparing ourselves to be able to connect Within. this entire city with what's going to be out there. Right, because what we'll has, Explain what's out there. Okay. Um, at, up to this point, the transoceanic uh, subsea cables have landed. Uh, the first two, well, I'm sorry, the first one was financed exclusively by Facebook and Microsoft. Mm -hmm. And that will tie into the um, data center announcement that Richmond made for Facebook's data center. Um, there are several others that I've, if I'm not mistaken, Virginia Beach is trying to get the designation for the Mid-Atlantic cable landing facility. Mm -hmm. So all of the cables would land at Virginia Beach and then be dispersed from there. Now, with those <coughs> being private cables, those two are strictly for those entities. But the other cables are the wholesale internet providers and things of that nature, which through the regional connections, um, all municipalities would have the opportunity to connect. So, so will our franchise agreement, uh, is, is there any language that uh, allows or prohibits the vendor from charging different rates for 4G versus 5G? I, I don't think we address that particular differentiation, but I will check, I will send you all an update and make sure I answer that question specifically. Okay. I don't, I, I, again, we are setting rates for facility and access, we're not doing the consumer end of it. We're, we're, we're discussing access to the right of way to facilities within the city uh, and the structure and fees related to that, not necessarily the consumer rate. Okay. Um, and, and I'm not sure um, that's what that network neutrality issue, I don't, I don't know what that's. Sure, in terms of the access. Right. Yeah. Um, I don't know if yeah. you want to. With, with the net neutrality, as you alluded to, that is the national hot topic at this point. If that is reversed, then that allows the internet service providers to prioritize the traffic. So that means if I myself are surfing the internet and customer X, they deem to be more business, business whatever the nomenclature may be, then they can slow my traffic down 
to have that bandwidth for that other customer. Mm. Yes. But, but present, presently, they can't discriminate like no. that. It's a, it's a free, open highway, as to say. Mm -hmm. So okay, so that, that's why I was curious if our franchise agreement. I don't, I don't know how that plays out with this. Well, one. I, I think the issue would be Dr. Whitaker um, making certain one whether or not we have the authority to mm -hmm. control that end of it, um, and because that may still be FCC related matters. Uh, as I said in my opening statement, within the confines of the law, I'm not certain, given the way this is structured as a utility, I'll have to look and make sure, but I don't. My suspicion is that the federal laws will govern those particular issues in terms of net neutrality and whatnot, as opposed to the local. What we have done and set forth is based on the discussion we had here in council, is to protect the interest of the locality to maintain as much control as we can have, make sure we don't have interference issues, and we can honor and assist our neighboring partners in terms of making sure they don't have an impediment or in a negative impact in terms of this process going forward, as well as making sure we are competitive with our uh, jurisdictions, our, our partner jurisdictions in the area in terms of the services we need in order to support these actual franchise agreements. To what extent will our franchise ordinance regulate um, fee, the current fee, and any increase in the fees? Those are set forth in, in the agreement. I, I, I can certainly provide you the detail. I believe I did send uh, the original fee with regard to new polls uh, and a prior communication, Not but the I can do franchise fee, but the fee that they charge the customer. Mayor, I, w I will um, I will tell you that the franchise agreement, as it is structured right now, and I'll provide you the additional detail. The uh, quite a bit of it has been on the implementation side, not the down end user side. Unlike the cable franchise agreements, which really sort of encompass the consumer aspects of it, um, as you will recall, SB 1282 really put us on the uh, process implementation end of the agreement. What we have had discussions with is, is strictly on the implementation of the infrastructure. I will tell you that some of the folks who have come forward have been not quite wholesalers, but brokers, you might determine brokers. They're not, like Cox, they're not the, necessarily the end user. They may be working for an end user, but they're much more like wholesalers. So we don't have as much information about the end use as, as uh, Mr. Jones has said, because that end use in some respect is not here as of yet. Bill, before I get another question though on that, do we has are you saying that the state code has preempted our ability to regulate what the franchise holder charges its customers? No, I'm saying that state code says in large part what we could charge for the fee of the process, as we talked about before, in terms of implementing the polls and whatnot. I get that. Uh, they have not. Um, the most recent provisions have not dictated end user fees as much as they have but dictated not, the process. We're not preempted from that. No, no. Okay. Beyond, beyond the uh, the fees for the, uh, uh, I guess the hardware. How about the franchise agreement itself? Is there a fee inv involved? Uh, a competitive process? We we have. Um, I mean, the fee for us. Certainly, and, and what we have done is we have looked at the fees associated with the neighboring localities and we have negotiated the fee in line with those localities to make certain that what we are collecting is both in line with state law and competitive with the neighboring jurisdictions. I think, um, I, I know Newport News, uh, the two that we have utilized in terms of our evaluation has been Norfolk and Virginia Beach, but Newport News has also had uh, a couple of goes at this Excuse already. Me. Also, what what is that fee? I can I, I provided it to you. Yeah. I know that per poll per new poll, I think the fee is a thousand dollars. 
purple and I'm at a loss right now to say the time period for that implementation. Uh, but I will provide that to you in detail, a, a scale sheet of that uh, tomorrow. I can get that to you tomorrow. Is there any potential revenue projection on, on what kind of revenue that would produce? Not yet. Uh, on an annual basis? We have not projected that at this point. And again, some of that depends on what the structures are as they go forward. So, sure. so this is, for lack of a better word, this is an output contract until they spec all the pieces. We, we have a unit price, but we don't have the number of units they intend to put in place. So we, we have a unit price. We don't have a um, scale up. Because otherwise, I would be quoting you um, the issues that we had with regard to our prior discussion, which is at some point in time, there'll be 990 of these polls out here. But I can't tell you for each provider how many they intend to put up on this particular day. However, please understand, you have a public hearing with this person coming before you. Right, one more question. You got the floor. OK. Uh, how about these polls? Uh, we, we've had uh, cell towers uh, wanting to put uh, cell towers in schoolyards and on athletic fields. Sure. Is anything in the franchise agreement that uh, protects schools and uh, athletic fields? The, the law uh, certainly uh, addresses that prior concern from that time period where there were considerable issues related to uh, safety and emissions from from school poles. Um, that cuts a little bit against the city because you cannot use that simply as a reason to uh, defeat the placement of a pole. However, each pole has a number of safety concerns, distances, and that sort of information. The safety issues you can address, <laughs> but you can't make the blanket statement, oh, you know, all cell towers emit whatever, you can't put it in the school. No, you can't use that as a basis to deny a franchise or deny a poll. But there are certain safety limits and conditions for each piece of this equipment. And so if there's an emission issue with a uh, facility, we're certainly within our rights to move that facility to where it would be safe in terms of operations. So we do have all of those uh, safety concerns that are still wrapped in the process of approval of particular poles and facilities. And can a private land owner cut their own deal beyond our franchise agreement? We, we don't. If, if, if a provider wants to place a facility on private property, short of there being some kind of police public safety <coughs> concern, that is an issue with the provider and the private individual. Dr. Whitaker, you can handle um, this one. When, when you use provider versus common carrier, um, the persons who are bidding on the, uh, these franchise agreements, are, are they the common carrier or are they um, the provide the provider that, that's I, like I, the rise of the I would I would put them in the classification of the common carrier. Yeah. They 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 are one removed, at least the folks we're dealing with are one removed from the actual in use process in terms of how how it be how the service would be monetized for a vehicle or whomever. Now again we're talking about in some respects, we're talking about folks who may be, um, let's use the real estate analogy. You may have a home builder and a developer. We're talking to the development end of it. So although they may be committed or, or aligned with one particular person, you will hear the name of the home builder. But we are dealing with the development end of it in terms of the backbone aspects of it. So in some respects, you could align the two together, but we're not necessarily talking to the front of the house in terms of what the sales will be to individuals. Okay. And so it's, it's those providers that can, um, when they tap into this common carrier, then it's these providers who can change the type of services that end users get based on usage that the net neutrality is trying to reach. Right. So like your Verizon and Sprint. Correct. So, so is there anything in, well, you say you'll get back with us as far as I, I will certainly uh, uh, nail that down for you all and provide you 
where our lines of demarcation are, okay. as well as where there may be any opportunity to affect the end user. But this is a bit different than uh, all entities put together. For instance, I, I will simply say, the folks you will talk to, the folks that will be identified on Friday, you won't be able to associate them with any particular nationally known entity, mm -hmm. whether they are associated with it or not, because that's a separate company. It's just like you would do a development deal. You set up an LLC to develop, and then here we have an end user at the other end. All right. Let's get back to annual franchise fee payment that the franchise holder pays the city. Um, does it, has the state code preempted local governments from basing that fee on gross revenue as opposed to polls? Yeah. And if you need to look that up, that's okay. fine. Yeah. I, I, will, I will have that answer like for you. That would be a, a good one. Mm -hmm. When they grow, we grow. Right. Yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm with you, Mayor. Yes. Um, mm -hmm. And I will certainly lay all of those pieces out and where the limitations are with regard to that. Because, again, as you all know, uh, one of the issues with regard to this, this, although some cities have gone forward and implemented these agreements early on, uh, one of the benefits in terms of trying to move this process forward is because, um, as you all have asked us to do, we, we are trying to keep our eye on the front, the legislative front with regard to these developments. Um, and there's always the potential every General Assembly session that the landscape sure. could change. And so here we have the first one uh, that we're looking at and presenting for you all's approval, understanding the landscape could shift under our ground for it. But I will certainly take a, uh, provide you the information with regard to the end process. My knee-jerk reaction is that um, an annual fee based on gross revenue, we'd have to depend on their self-reporting that, Sure, would be better than individual polls because <coughs> as the market grows, we benefit from that. Well, and so my question is, can we do that? You, you will recall the manner in which the state sort of chipped away at the locality's control was by monetizing the process. But as you state, um, whether they pre preempted the whole field has been a bit of a question. What they did preempt is the um, ability for them to get the infrastructure in place. The revenue aspect of it, uh, I would say, has not been pre preempted in total. But you're, you're sort of walking on one side of the street trying to, um, again, predict what's happening on the other side. The state has certainly, they're coming at us in a particular direction. They may not have gotten all the way to, the, to replacing the locality. But they're certainly coming into that direction. But I will answer that question for you and provide you an answer with regard to where our controls are with regard to rates, revenue. OK. Any other questions? We look forward to getting the response. I will have those for you tomorrow. Okay. Right. Uh, Mrs. Skelly will come forward with FY18 first quarter budget review. Mm -hmm. I'll get it. I'll, go, I'll, I'll look at it tomorrow. We'll, we'll put out all. Good evening, Vice Mayor Rowe, Vice Mayor Cherry, City Council members. We distributed a two-page quarterly update report uh, from September 30th, which is 25% of the year lapsed. It's in your presentation in the last page. I ha do have extra hard copies if anybody wanted to get a copy. Um, Can you pass one around? Sure. 
I'm sorry. It's not. He said it's in. It's in the last um, page of the slideshow. If you, if you want to see it, but we'll, we'll definitely ask for it. I don't know. It's not in the last. Where can we get it? Yeah, we like to come here. We're getting it. Pass the hard time. This is a cash basis unaudited report and what we did is um, one side is the general fund and the other side is other, other major funds. And we compare um, prior years in the general fund just to show the, the trend. On this slide is some of the updates. Um, through September 30th. The FY 2018 budget results for the first quarter revenues are in line with the budget as compared to previous years. So while about 25% of the way through, typically you don't receive all your monies uh, the first three quarter, the first three months. And so we, we do get about 18, 16 to 18% in the first three quarters. So we're in line with previous years. And expenditures for the general fund are in line with budget. New, new treasurer is going to speed that process up. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Also, our major funds, our public utilities are in line with how they, they track from last year, and then our waste management fund has um, are in line with the, the the revenues. The encumbrances expenditures are slightly higher because we do a three million dollar encumbrance for our SIPSA disposal fee in the beginning of the year. There are some re variances occurring though that I wanted to point out and I'd like to share. For revenue, the investment earnings are higher than budgeted and will continue that way throughout the year. That is um, in part due to our cash flow and in part due to uh, more aggressive uh, uh, investments. Our VDOT revenue is slightly less than our budget as the number of lane miles and the mix of lane miles changed slightly after VDOT conducted a statewide audit and this was done um, after the budget was completed. This variance revenue will stay the same for the year. And our ambulance billing. Do we ask questions as we go along? Oh, sure. Mm -hmm. So at the end of the year, you're projecting a net difference of 152000 Yes. Okay. For VDON. That's the total year. The investment earnings will go up or down depending on Got that. Um, yeah. how much money we have to invest. Actually, it'll only go up. 136 might go up. And then VDOT, that's Rockville. that's the whole year. Uh, ambulance billing is right now $200,000 lower than our revenue. And there's a few reasons for that. It's the timing of bills, but we're also using a more conservative approach to our collection rate. And we hope for, to have this variance go down as we move improve our processes to that particular um, function. Our expenditure variance. For the first quarter, the city is having a um, significant overtime for our fire department. And in the third quarter, the city's uh, retirement supplement will take effect and there will be a variance for that. So as in summary, our revenues are in line with budget and expenditures are tracking closely with budget and ha we have minimal savings. We will need a budget transfer for the fire overtime, and an ordinance will be on the December 12th docket requesting a transfer to carry through to January 2018. A new fire academy started November 20th, with trainees graduating in the spring of 2018. To help mitigate overtime costs, the city's in the process of rehiring several previously trained firefighters who will require only minimal training, so they'll be able to get back up and, and, and up to um, working on the uh, shifts. And the department has also implemented many steps to minimize the need for overtime usage. In early January, we'll do further analysis to determine how much we're going to need for the rest of the year based on the vacancies uh, that we have and then the actual dollar amounts of the overtime we'll need. This last slide shows the second quarter budget transfer to be requested next next week, or next council meeting, excuse me. And that's the cost for the first and second quarter expenditures. The fire department should have $480,000 of vacancy savings, which will cover the $480,000 in overtime costs. Wanted to point out, most of our overtime increase from the 
between 2017 and 2018 is due to the average 8% increase to the pay in public safety. We did that to improve our entry level salaries to be competitive with neighborhood jurisdictions. We did budget some uh, salaries increases for non -departmental account in non-departmental accounts, so there should be some budget savings in that account to be used for this, these overtime costs. And then we will also do more analysis in January to come up with a, a more firm number of how much we'll need for the rest of the year. Was there additional fire salary vacancy funding or did we <coughs> expend it all? Is that the whole thing? Right now, this is what we're projecting is the fire vacancy savings, except that we do have some funds in our non-departmental that we put in for the pay increases that we were anticipating. We did not move those to departments, so there will be some savings there. We do anticipate some vacancy savings in other departments. We're also monitoring our police fire, our police overtime, which is very, it's it's right on target with our budget and some of the air vacancy savings. So I don't think we're going to need a transfer for police, but knock on wood, you know, we're early in the year, so hopefully nothing more will we need for that. So Ms. Ke Ms. Kelly, so yes. this is a, um, this, this vacancy savings, is that from the first quarter? That's what I project for the rest of the year, for fire. Okay. Um, the, whole, the whole general fund might have more savings that we'll be able to use for over time. Okay, because um, I, I was just, if we just hired, um, at our last meeting, I thought we hired and We hired a, a training class and we're hiring a nine, uh, hopefully, new. So we'll, ha we'll be filled up. So it will be the, the vacancy savings. Yeah, I guess you could say it's for the first two quarters because um, we shouldn't have any vacancy savings for the rest of the year. So the, so the fact that you just <clears throat> that you hired the um, new firefighters this quarter, that's not washing out that savings from the no, first quarter. No, because we'll still have that. We'll have that savings, um, but we will still have overtime costs because they, until they're fully trained, they can't ride on the trucks and and do the shift. Anything further? That's good. Thank you. All right. This ends our presentations for this evening. And that concludes our business. Good meeting tonight. We're adjourned. See you tomorrow at 5.